Hi, I'm Jason Hoffman, Vice President of Buckeye Educational Systems. We are your partner in all things education and have relationships with the world's premier suppliers in the educational arena. We are committed to helping you bring engaging and exciting learning to your classroom, hybrid, and online virtual experiences. I'm your local representative for these educational technologies curriculum and support, and here's what I want to share with you today. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to talk a bit about uh, this manufacturing credential puzzle, um, as many uh, think of that and refer to that because um, there are a lot of pieces and parts and kind of understanding how those pieces and parts um, fit together um, is very critical. And uh, so uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, first, you know, as we, we talk about industry credentials in general, why, why even do we have industry credentials? And I always think of it similarly as it's the same reason why we have to have a degree at a college, because at some point you have to have some sort of a measure for communication to understand what a person has learned or done while they've gone through college. And the industry credentials provide the same thing um, uh, for employers and, and for people to communicate and understand what a person would know based on the, the credential that they've achieved. But for companies, obviously, it, it does help a lot with reducing your hiring costs, um, having that knowledge and understanding what a person would know coming in, um, understanding what additional training might be needed or training you wouldn't have to pay for, obviously. Um, it also ensures, especially as the credentials uh, continue to be updated and as long as they're, you know, your ISO uh, validated credentials as well, um, they, they continually have to be updated to make sure that they're achieving the need of industry as well. Um, obviously, one major factor is always making sure that not only is the workplace itself safe, um, but also that we can also increase the quality of the products that are going out um, uh, of each of these companies as well. Obviously, there's been a lot of focus on uh, industry credentials and, and even apprenticeships um, over the last uh, uh, five or six years. Um, it's gotten a lot more press nationally, even, uh, you know, through the, the general news and uh, through government and all of those types of things. Um, obviously, the new Perkins 5 uh, allocations um, put a large focus on industry credentials um, for the purposes of end of program certifications, again, to help standardize across different programs so that if a person comes out of a program from one school, um, and even if it's the same program in another school, um, it, it provides that level of, uh, of uh, validation that they come up, they, there was at least a set of uh, common standards being taught in those. Um, it also provides employers with that assurance that the worker has met some sort of a minimal standard. The other thing that it does is it helps on the vocabulary, the, the communication, you know, understanding of the course systems um, and being able to communicate those with a common vocabulary um, uh, as well. Um, obviously, if you're a job seeker, you know, a company puts out a, a uh, request for, a, you know, resumes and that sort of thing. Obviously, you could be in a stack of a 500 uh, resumes on a desk, but obviously having those credentials is one way to get your name, you know, uh, put to the top of that list um, with that. And a big part is, is it does provide that program credibility. We know this program teaches these standards. We know that's what they're going to come out with um, with that when they when they come and they know that a person coming from that not only has that credential, but they also can validate that they have those skills, you know, that are associated with that. Um, and again, the, the major push right now for apprenticeships and pre-apprenticeship programs uh, nationally, um, there's also that uh, um, that is there. A lot of what I'm going to talk about today um, are specifically going to be on industry credentials, not so much on manufacturer specific credentials. You know, there's lots of different credentials and credentialing organizations that are out there. Um, but the groups that we that we work with and tend to focus on um, with the solutions that we offer um, are more industry based because you know the industry is a major enterprise and there's every job every occupation we exists within that enterprise 
And so we're trying to not look at a specific industry um, or a specific job within that industry, um, but looking at the industry as a whole. Um, and that's where true, like, a, and that's where the industrial certifications come into play. The ones we're going to be talking about today and the, the three primary ones that, uh, again, have been um, uh, validated and, and approved uh, by the Ohio Department of Education, as well as the Ohio Manufacturers Association, again, among, amongst others as well. Um, uh, we'll be talking about today is MSSC, which is the Manufacturing Skills Standard Council. Uh, NIMS, which is the National Institute of Metalworking Skills, and they have both machining level credentials as well as the new industrial technology maintenance, uh, ITM as it's referred to uh, with that. And then SACA, which is a one of the newest ones, and it's the first of its kind with a true industry 4.0 smart automation um, uh, credentials. Um, and those were just approved uh, at OD on, on on the ODE website or on at ODE in December for next school year um, and going into uh, as a part of that approved list. The other one that is on here you're going to notice is PMMI. We put that on here because uh, we also work with this company called uh, Amazon and 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 Amazon is a uh, they have their own industrial maintenance training program for their distribution centers and they prepare the PMMI credential. So that becomes relevant in these pockets and in these areas around the state where we have these distribution centers and that. Um, but is, it is actually the packaging uh, institute um, for, for that and then you can see uh, what that is. So even though that one is an industry credential, um, it's very specific and uh, uh, for that, uh, uh, warehousing and, and different things along that lines as well. You're going to see that the uh, kind of the way that the the credentials are divided you in across the industry, you have your supply chain automation credentials, and then you have your industrial maintenance and advanced manufacturing credentials. And then you have it's kind of and segmented then into industry 4.0 which is referring to the fourth industrial revolution. And this is around smart automation, which I'll get into uh, a bit later. You'll also notice that the credentials uh, kind of go from top to bottom, uh, the lower level being an entry level, uh, what we call a lot of times an operator level uh, credential. Um, when you get into the mid-level credentials um, with that, um, now you're getting into more of the technical technician level, um, sometimes also referred to because um, there, there's a blending now of operator technology, operation technology, um, and blending with IT information technology. And so uh, we'll be looking at that uh, a little bit as well. So that mid-level and then one of the uh, another advantage with SACA is that they also are developing that professional level. So that advanced higher level data analytics, data analysis, um, uh, and all of that that uh, will be available with uh, SACA as well. So that is, uh, we'll get into that too. So the first of that in the supply chain automation areas, again, especially Ohio, we really are at a crossroads in the supply chain um, industry. Um, we have many, many uh, uh, major distribution centers, you know, here uh, that, that are a part of our economy here in the state of Ohio. MSSC has developed um, and worked with that industry very closely. Um, and the first that they came out with was their certified logistics technician um, uh, credentials. Um, those credentials are that entry level, operator level, uh, um, but more front office. So it's more the, the front office functions of how we move products around the world um, and doing that. And it's broken into two sections. So we have the um, certified logistics associate, which is CLA, and then the certified logistics technician, which is the CLT. Then they do have one on fork, uh, forklift uh, technicians as well. That's actually the repairing and maintenance of forklifts, but that's not as predominant, that's not very widely used, I guess you could say, um, uh, with that. Then this year they rolled out um, their new, one of their newest credentials and I got to and that is on the uh, supply chain te technician. Um, 
And again, that's developed, that was a new occupation that was developed by the National Center for Supply Chain um, Automation. And again, worked with uh, MSSC um, to develop this uh, new credential. Again, this is at a higher level skill set um, above that, that, that lower level of the um, CLT. Um, it's broken into three different uh, sections. And again, a supply chain technician by, de by uh, definition is a person who installs, operates, supports, upgrades, or maintains. And you'll notice or because obviously this is a variety of occupations that exist um, in these centers. It isn't one person necessarily that is doing all of these things, but, is, but they uh, maintain those automated material handling equipment, the conveyors, the belts, the motors, the sensors, all of those things that support the supply chain uh, industry. And it is broken into three uh, different uh, certificates. So the EM is your equipment maintenance, ER, which is for equipment repair, and then NR. And this, this is one of the first times you'll see today where I talk about bringing in those IT skills, that network repair um, aspect of this as well. And so, uh, uh, you know, and now, so now these, these technicians in these organizations have to have, you know, the, the operators tend to have to have IT skills and the IT people tend to need those operator skills and it's starting that blending of that and that lines those lines are blurring uh, quite a bit um, as we're seeing out in the industry uh, today. Again, these organizations are not put together by you know uh, people who are not in those industries and you can see, um, you know, the major uh, uh, organizations that are a part of it. Actually, the National Center for Supply Chain Automation has had a presence in uh, the Dayton area for a lot of years as they've been working towards the development of these credentials um, as well. So uh, actually in Dayton, as well as out in California, were two of the uh, initial centers for supply chain automation um, uh, with that. Amatrol is also a partner in this and the development of the trainer that these organizations asked for and, and spec'd out, as well as the e-learning that is used in preparing these uh, technicians for these credentials um, and the assessments that were developed by MSSC uh, with that. When you get into that, um, you can see it's not, there. there is no, um, prerequisite knowledge. Um, so literally you can go at any level. Each one of the levels is about 150 hours um, in content. So again, I mentioned before that this is not like a person. This is a variety of people. So again, they can start in any one of the three areas uh, in order to do that. And again, work through a pathway to continue to do and work on these stackable credentials um, uh, with all of that. And you can see if they do get all three, they receive what's considered a master's certification uh, designation. Um, we have three centers right now in the state of Ohio that are uh, uh, setting themselves up to become um, uh, uh, programs um, offering this credential, uh, Sinclair Community College, uh, Columbus State Community College, and Lorain County JVS. Um, all three have uh, gotten their in process for uh, becoming the first three centers in the state of Ohio um, to offer this new uh, credential. This particular one has not been submitted to the state, I'm assuming in the next round because it wasn't ready for submission when the, the last round. So obviously those three are doing that. So I'm sure that they'll be submitting that um, onto the state list for uh, next year, but they're doing it because the need, the demand, and the and the the knowledge is necessary um, for the workforce that we that we need here in our local economy. It uses this hands-on um, assessment unit called the Skill Boss Logistics. Um, it's kind of hard to tell in here, but um, that unit is about eight to ten foot long. If you factor in the control box that has the PLC and the uh, variable frequency drive and all that, so just to give you an idea of of and, and typically four to six students would be learning and using this system simultaneously um, uh, to practice and to do the hands-on skills and the hands-on assessment uh, for the credential. It across all three of those certificates. 
So it's one system that is used to um, that is used across all three of those. The pilot programs were run this year. Um, again, the big companies like uh, Walmart and Amazon and Target and I'm trying to think of some of the others that were involved um, that came in um, said it hit you know it hit the mark in every area. So uh, we were pretty happy with the uh, initial um, pilots that were that were done with us. Again, the benefits, um, and you'll see this is pretty consistent um, across, but again, nationally portable. Um, industry-led training, again, it is the industry, the supply chain automation industry that develops this, this content and, and the need uh, for this. Um, again, it was these major companies within that industry that have been around forever um, uh, and being able to do that. <clears throat> right now, as you, as you know, really across most of our economy, most of our communities around the state, you know, warehouse distribution supply chain is a very high demand area um, uh, with that. And again, it's a great uh, opportunity and great career pathway for these for uh, students and employers, employees to be able to uh, to work on. One of the other factors that you're going to see that is very critical in everything that we do um, and what companies are asking for is making sure that the, the troubleshooting um, of these systems is something that is built into um, the, the credentials. And so not only how a system operates, but what are the things that happen to those types of systems? How do we identify those problems? And then what is the proper way to uh, troubleshoot that? And, um, it does have our computerized uh, fault insertion called Fault Pro uh, built into it. And obviously, everybody, when you're looking at credentials, you know, it, the only way to really excite people into this is to give them those hands on experiences uh, with that. And so this takes what, you know, sometimes is, or most of the time, acres and acres of a system, you know, uh, under a roof and brings it down into a tabletop version to see all the systems and how they work and integrate and communicate um, uh, with that. And again, can be customized and it is transport, it is uh, uh, portable and can be transported, um, uh, you know, to different centers as well. One that many of you are probably aware of that, that has probably been around and been adopted very heavily has been the CPT and the CPT plus um, uh, credentials. And so again, this is that operator, that basic level. I probably should have done this one prior to the other one. Sorry, in, in, in that. It is that entry level, that operator level, um, core skills. You know, I was referred to it a lot of times that if you were to look at a modern industrial arts program in a high school um, these days, it really fits the bill for what a student should be able to know and do coming out of a standard uh, entry level uh, industrial program um, with that. Obviously, safety and quality. Obviously, as we talked about earlier, um, the aspect of uh, having not only a safe work environment, environment but also that quality product um, and quality practices that come out of that facility as well. Um, and then giving them the, those opportunities to understand how the machines work and how the processes work. And that's what the manufacturing processes and production, um, uh, understanding the, the basic systems that, that exist within these companies. And then there's just different style machines that do all of these things. And then understanding basic maintenance, understanding they wouldn't be necessarily the person who would be doing the maintenance, but they would understand the types of problems that could come up in the day-to-day -day operating and the running of a machine to make sure that that uh, machine is well-maintained, um, as well as, you know, hearing for certain noises and sounds and things that could be an indicator of a problem that they would need to bring their maintenance department in uh, in order to do that. Um, this one is also built into uh, four modules. So each of these four modules, um, safety, quality, manufacturing processes, maintenance awareness, those are four individual certificates. Um, as of last year, or as of right now, the state of Ohio, um, if a student was looking for that 12 point industry credential, um, they had to pass all four of these in order to do that. Um, and so, but starting this next year, the state of Ohio is breaking these out um, by recommendation from the Ohio Manufacturers Association, and they're going to be uh, broken into three, um, three points a piece. 
um, with that. So again, you could take two of these and then maybe stack them with another credential if you wanted to, um, how, you know, however you would want to, to be able to do that. And so uh, again, you'll see this is all, um, all the e-learning and all the curriculum that was developed by MSSC is powered and runs on the Amatrol um, portal uh, uh, for that and preparing the students uh, for to take these exams. CPT itself does not require any uh, hands-on. However, um, they did partner with Amatrol to develop our first Skill Boss, which is Skill Boss Manufacturing. Again, this is a working running system that allows students to see a system that maybe would, would be, you know, a, a large facility shrunken down into a tabletop uh, um, uh, setup so that again, they can practice over 50, it's about 55, 56 hands-on skills um, that they do while they're working through the curriculum. So again, I don't really consider this a trainer. This is actually a, a working system. And then they perform different skills on this working system relating to um, upgrading it, relating to maintaining it, um, running, operating it, and that sort of thing. We do have some schools that have enhanced that and taken that a bit further. Um, and they also use uh, our precision measurement, electrical relay control. There's a, a group up in the, uh, at the Auburn Career Center up in the Lake County area um, that is doing this with their high schools. And they brought some of the more, more hands-on to the students because students don't have any idea what's going on inside of these facilities. I would say, you know, if, if the walls could be glass, they would have a lot better idea of what um, is going on inside of these buildings and inside of these centers. Um, but most students, if you ask them what a manufacturer actually does, most of them don't have a clue what manufacturing really is, nor do they understand the, the skills. And so again, trying to give this in a way that they can uh, make it more hands-on with that. If the student goes through and prepares uh, using the skill boss and is able to do and demonstrate those 55 skills on the skill boss at the end, they then would qualify for a CPT plus credential which means plus hands-on um, uh, with that. So they not only have the knowledge, but they have the skill um, associated with that um, as well. Again, this is an entry level um, certification being used in high schools, community colleges, um, workforce training right in the, um, in the programs. And this is a pre-apprenticeship um, uh, pre approved program uh, nationally. Um, 560 hours that feeds into that 3,000 hour IMT apprenticeship uh, program. It is ISO 17024 accredited, which is the gold standard for certifications um, as well, which again means it is continually uh, monitored and updated. And that's where the new CPT 4.0 that was released this year, which is the next generation of that um, uh, of that curriculum and that assessment. Um, and so uh, it uh, that was part of that review process and how it had to be. Again, it's flexible, so it can be done with or without the hands-on aspect of it. Um, and we also are now finding where companies, and this is an example where Cummins uh, 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 is actually putting on job descriptions that they prefer people to come to them with CPT um, on that, the same as Walmart distribution centers will put CLT um, uh, as a preference um, as being able to do that. And again, we have people doing this as early as starting at the ninth grade is just part of intro classes as well as and, and moving up from there. It is connected to the OSHA 10 as well. So if you have an instructor who is uh, OSHA certified that is teaching this course and the student passes the safety module of MSSC, they also then are given their OSHA 10 credential on top of by, achieve, by going through that as well. But again, the one requirement that the instructor must, be, must have that OSHA certification uh, in order to do that. Jason? Yes. Jay, this is Chris. Uh, we have two uh, items in the chat you might want to address. One of them goes back to your prior slides. Um, if I can throw these out to you. Sure, go ahead. Uh, first, individuals need to be CLA, CLT, CFT certified before getting an EM slash ER slash NR no. certification. 
No, there are no prerequisites. There are no prerequisites for that. Um, again, it's actually personal. It's actually two separate skill sets, really. Those associate, the certified logistics associate and technician are actually more the front office types of person, not typically the person that is working out in the, the actual distribution center itself. And so, no, there is no prerequisite for those lower levels. Um, but I can see where, because of my graphic, that being confusing. So um, yeah. there are no prerequisites and you can do the NR, ER and EM in any order as well, or any one of the three, two of the three or all three. Great, but thank you, want, you. But if you want that master's level uh, uh, certification um, or be considered master's level, you would have to pass all three. Good, thank you for answering that. The second question was, must the skill boss be used or are other simulators allowed? Uh, for CPT, MSSC requires for them to be able to get the CPT plus. Um, it does require them to uh, use the uh, uh, skill boss manufacturing um, is required. They must be able to perform those skills on the skill boss to get their CPT plus. That's MSSC's uh, requirement. They designed and built the system for their credentials. So um, it is a requirement. It is not required to get your CPT credential, nor is it required to get the points associated at the state level. But we just find that students do a whole lot better um, with the skill boss, um, considerably better having that hands-on. If you have other ways, you know, we have one school, I believe it's um, uh, Lincoln View, I'm thinking it is over um, on the Western side of the state. You know, he has a traditional industrial arts shop and so he is able to take the activities that the students are doing in the um, in the CPT curriculum, and then he takes them out into the shop and then shows them lockout tag out on one of his devices out there, or you know electrical systems on actual machines that he has out there. So it is a way of being able to do that, but they're not again doing the CPT plus. Um, they do also have a skill boss there that is, they borrow from uh, Northwest State Community College as well, um, who uses this widely in their region. That's great. Thanks for clarifying everything on that, Jason. I'm going to let you go on. I'll keep an eye on the chat for you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I can't. I just see them. I just see a number increasing. I don't. I don't actually. See, I don't actually see what the questions are. So sorry about you got, that. You got enough to do to just to keep going with the presentation. So thank you. So the next area are the NIMS uh, ITM credentials that we're going to talk about. Um, the NIMS uh, duty areas. There are nine different duty areas. Um, the state of Ohio has grouped those into groups of three. So they take those nine. And, and group them. Uh, so uh, one, eight, nine is a 12 point, is worth 12 points. Two, three, and four are worth 12 points. And five, six, and seven are, are worth 12 points. So you have to do one of those groupings if your focus and, and need is, is to um, get that 12 points um, in doing that. But uh, again, this in here is very flexible. There are no prerequisites either for any of these um, uh, as well. And so uh, each one of these are approximately 100 to 150 hours, 160 hours in length. Um, uh, so each one of the nine. So again, if you're looking at a, a program, you know, and if you're trying to get, you know, group three of those together, basically, um, uh, you know, that's, you, you'd have to kind of uh, build it out accordingly. The other thing is, is that I found has been very popular and what schools are wanting to do um, is many schools have wait lists for their welding programs. And many times students, you know, sign up for welding because of the need, the demand and, and all of that. Here's a way of bringing in a maintenance program and they still get a welding credential because a lot of times students sign up for welding just because they want to know how to weld. Whether they're going to do it for a living or not, you know, that's kind of their thing. Maybe, it, you know, it'd be a part of something that they do. But you can get a maintenance welding credential from NIMS. Um, that's duty area eight uh, by doing that. And then using your current, you know, welding equipment that you have at your school, um, students can go through and get that um, uh, welding credential and again, kind of build that out. So 
uh, you know, I have schools that will implement just one, eight, nine, and, you know, for uh, into there, uh, and then just use their own welding lab in order to to be able to do uh, to do that. Give you a little bit of a background. NIMS has been around for a very long time, formed back in 1995, um, and uh, that it really was focused on, and they really come from that Metalworking Trade Association. So the the that's where the National Institute of Metalworking Skills, your your um, precision machining programs and that sort of thing. Again, as we all know, for many, many years, I've been doing this for 30 years, and I have yet to hear anybody tell me how they have no problems with recruiting students into machining programs, even though it's one of the most highly uh, sought after and, and uh, one of the best job security types of positions that exist out there uh, in doing that. But again, you can see the industry um, is the one who put this credential together. Um, and, and today, you know, uh, NIMS is a sort is that source for those industry standards and certification for jobs and manufacturing uh, focused on now both the machining as well as the industrial technology maintenance areas. They say, you know, one of the things that we hear with the, this mid-level credential is that a student coming out with these mid-level credentials is very similar to them having like a year's worth of work experience to coming in because it actually has the troubleshooting built into it. We're not just going to learn pneumatics. We're going to understand pneumatic maintenance and we're going to understand pneumatic troubleshooting uh, as a part of all of those. We're going to understand basic electricity, but electrical troubleshooting um, uh, as a part of that. And again, we all know uh, gaining those troubleshooting skills uh, in the past, that's just been the person that's been there the longest that's seen the most problems they, and they tend to be the best troubleshooter. Um, so because of the pipeline, we're having to try to fill that much quicker and teach those as a part of our programs. NIMS themselves have issued over, you know, 100, over 115,000 credentials. They're very uh, widely used and adopted nationally by public and private uh, uh, institutions and industries, military, um, all of those types of things. Again, here's a, an example I was able to show of the actual companies that are a part of not only were a part of the development of it, but also continue to monitor and look at these uh, skill sets as well to make sure that they're uh, current, modern, um, and all that. And again, you can look through this list and see, you know, companies where we have here in Ohio a very uh, uh, that you know are some of our local economies. Um, uh, with that, that that were a part of this too. So the way that they uh, set this up, there is a performance plus theory gets them the credential. So the student would work through um, uh, the curriculum. Um, they would learn the knowledge or the theory. Then there are, there are skills that they are going to practice and learn as they go through the program. Um, then they have to demonstrate um, those skills um, and they have to actually do it three different times within the system. And then the instructor has to sign off that that person has done and is able to do those skills. Then they log on to the computer. They uh, take the, the cognitive test, the theory test. And if they pass that because the instructor's already said then that they've demonstrated the skills, it spits out and says, here's your credential uh, in being able to uh, to do that. Amatrol again worked with NIMS and developed um, the online um, uh, uh, software for the ITM certifications as well, as well as those assessment manuals. So again, you have to assess those skills three times uh, within the program and their assessment manuals and their OJT guides that they developed. So if somebody wants them to, to demonstrate these skills, maybe at a work site, um, uh, they've developed the guides and everything for how to assess the skills to verify um, a student's uh, knowledge and skill uh, for each one of the credentials in all nine of the areas. This gives you an idea. You can see that each one um, uh, is approximately uh, they ground out to about 100 hours. Again, you can see that the welding and the piping are the two uh, of the lowest, but when you group those together into those areas like the state and the Ohio Manufacturers Association uh, group those together, um, you can see they're all approximately 300 hours in length to do uh, uh, to do those. But again, 
that's just their grouping for the 12 points. Again, you can do these in any order. You can do one, you can do all nine, you can do whatever your local community, what the companies in your area are asking and, and what the need is for uh, uh, in being able to, to do that. And you can see, we obviously have aligned and, and developed training systems as well that are in line with the uh, curriculum and for the training of that uh, in order to be able to do it. It would be very difficult to do NIMS without equipment. I would tell you that it, it, it literally would be impossible. Um, you would have to have, you, you are gonna have to have training systems in order to be able to, um, to do that, so. And this just gives you an idea of the types of systems that are in there. Again, the credentials are broken down. The what, we're, what we refer to many times now in the industry as micro credentials. They call these module credentials, but their micro credentials are considered those duty areas. And again, focused at that middle level skill. Typically, these are done at a career tech, community college, workforce training, apprenticeship uh, level. So. Um, I've yet to see anybody doing this, you know, any lower than say 11th grade um, uh, with that. And so um, again, all of them are very thorough um, and it takes a while to get through the duty areas um, because they do have to do all of the, the performance skill assessments in the online. And so that's why we have the hours broken out to help people plan out and build their programs accordingly. Um, but again, all this has been validated by those industry partners within the NIMS network. Um, and again, focused on that industrial maintenance area. That's a you know, huge need, huge demand right now out in industry, trying to find these maintenance technicians um, uh, and being able to, to do that. This again is that industrial, that maintenance pathway. A lot of what we were talking about with some of the others, you know, that entry level is that operator pathway. Um, this would be definitely that maintenance pathway uh, for students uh, and being able to uh, being able to do this. And again, um, we have it all aligned and make it easy for for uh, institutions to implement it. Jason, so then the, Jason, yeah, yeah. If I interrupt you a second, we have another question that came through in the chat. Uh huh. It says in the Amatrol ML, ML, LMS portal, it shows Amatrol slash SACA with the e-learning activation codes. Will students automatically receive their SACA certifications upon successful completion or do they have to do something else to? They will, well, I'll show you that on the SACA here in just a moment, um, okay, kind of how that breaks down. I, I'll answer that in the, the last part of the last section of my discussion here, okay? Sounds, sounds great, thank you. Okay. So again, SACA, the Smart Automation Certification Alliance at SACA.org. If you want to get more information um, about SACA um, with that, they're based out of uh, Louisville, Kentucky, um, is where the uh, uh, parent uh, organization, Jim Wall, who was previously the executive director of NIMS, um, is now the executive director of SACA. So he knows industry and he knows the industry credentials and, and the processes in order to put all this together. Um, uh, he's uh, very well equipped in order to do that. The first level of SACA, you have the associate level and each one of these associate level credentials and micro credentials um, are uh, broken into these four areas, your basic operations, advanced operations, robot, and IIoT. Again, you'll see where, as we start to continue to do this in this industrial area, these IT skills are being you know, brought into the, the knowledge and skills that these industrial workers need uh, in doing that. And you're gonna see that here. Um, then you have the specialist level. Um, and I think on my chart, I'll go on and see if it, but there's actually six different levels of specialist currently. Um, and there's actually two more being developed. Um, and then ultimately there'll be, there'll be the professional level um, credential as well. And that's actually being uh, developed and piloted by the University of Wisconsin Stout um, uh, for, for that is where that's being currently spearheading that, that part of the development. Again, SACA is a nonprofit foundation, 501c3, um, supported by industry. And again, their mission was to develop 
occupational skill standards to promote careers, train teachers, and certify individuals in many functions of the smart automation industry 4.0 connected enterprise technologies. Um, and so that's the, you'll even notice, it was kind of a cool thing how they developed the logo. You'll notice the little Wi-Fi signals built into the S uh, with that. I thought that was a pretty creative thing that they came up with on that. Again, companies, the, the companies that were a part of the development of this, um, of these standards, you're, you're going to see again, this is a broad based industry um, based program. Um, so you have comp uh, companies like Sergento, which is a food um, cheese. They, you know, we've all probably had uh, cheese. Uh, so you have the food production. You know, many students don't think about in manufacturing that all of our all of our food is basically manufactured um, uh, in that. And so um, they don't when they think of manufacturing, they think of cars and, you know, airplanes and and things like that. They don't really think about the fact that everything is in one way or another uh, manufactured Arians, who's, uh, does, uh, tractors and implements and, and those types of things. Ashley furniture, the largest furniture manufacturer in the world. Um, Foxconn is the, uh, uh, largest contract manufacturer in the world. And they're the ones who produce all of the iPads and the iPhones and, and that. So again, and, and, uh, Rockwell automation, um, the largest, uh, uh, in the area of controls and PLCs and 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 systems that way, as well as Fanuc Robotics, the uh, largest um, robotics manufacturer um, and most widely used uh, throughout the world. Those are the types of companies, Boeing. You can see that you know that have been a part of developing these standards, validating the standards um, as this was being developed and and put together. And here's even a larger list. This was the initial group. Um, when it started, and then here's uh, kind of an expanded list of others um, that have that have come on uh, uh, in there as well. So um, there was one in particular because I can't remember how to. No, oh, I'll come back. Rockwell Automation has come on as a platinum sponsor. Again, Rockwell is a good, you know, has a very large footprint, obviously here, right here in Ohio. Um, with that. Um, and in talking with uh, Michael myself, um, specifically, one of the things that he likes about SACA and why they support it is because they really like the fact that this is an industry credential, not a manufacturer's credential. As many of you know, Rockwell has their own uh, credentials that they use to uh, um, uh, cert, you know, to certify people by, that go through their programs with that. But they like the fact that this that SACA is being developed by the industry, um, uh, not by a, as a manufacturer's credential. And again, here in 2021, 2021, they came on as a platinum member of SACA um, to support, and they are actually offering and doing the SACA credentials with their employees um, as well. SACA is divided into two areas. Um, there is a silver. And this happened because of because of COVID. Um, they they developed and created a silver level and a gold um, level credentials. Silver level is knowledge based. So again, you can go through, um, demonstrate, and pass the test that you have the knowledge. You'll get your silver certification. Um, and if you pass the gold level credential, that means that you can do the performance assessments that are that are uh, that have been designed by SACA. Um, in order to be able to, to do that. State of Ohio, the silver level credentials um, or the credentials the, um, are set at three points and four points. There's the, I'll show you this in a minute, but the associate level are three points apiece and the gold level, I'm sorry, the associate level are three point and the specialist level are um, four points. Um, and again, all of these are stackable into my, in a series of micro credentials that I'm going to show you here in a minute. <clears throat> Again, using that 17024 compliant process to make sure that the standards meet the needs and, and continue to be relevant. Um, and again, uh, developed by those major in, in industrial uh, companies. <clears throat> One of the things that they, the way it's set up is that if a person has their gold credential, they have the ability then to certify a person 
to certify people to be gold themselves. So if we certify a teacher to have a gold credential of SACA, then that teacher can certify all of their students. All the silver certifications are done through the uh, um, uh, online uh, portal. Um, and yes, when a person comes goes through and takes that test at the end, it gives them and tells them whether they passed it right there and then uh, in being able to do that. The biggest difference with SACA in the way that they've done as a, as a not-for-profit organization or a nonprofit organization is that the certifications are free to students and employees of the Alliance members. So once a high school, as an example, becomes a member that at, for $500, um, they can certify as many students as they want for that amount. Um, if a college wants to become a, a member, um, then they can do that for 25 and again, can certify any anybody that is a student of that college. That would include your CCIP students as well. So if a student is enrolled through a post-secondary option at the high school, but they're and they, which means they are a, a college uh, student, then they would also uh, fall under that same um, umbrella. And then they have for SACA, for industry uh, members, um, they do it based on numbers of employees and they range anywhere from $500 to $3,500. One of the things as this is being put out, uh, Buckeye Educational Systems, uh, we are paying 25% of these fees for organizations this year. So as an example, a high school can be a member for $375 and you can purchase up to a three-year um, uh, membership at the reduced rates um, uh, if that's something that somebody would want to do. But again, the uh, credentials then are free to anybody who's a member of that institution. This was the chart I was talking about earlier getting to. So you'll see here that it's broken into four levels of associate um, uh, with that. And so again, that, that entry level operations um, for those uh, industry 4.0 operators. And that's where you're seeing OT, operational technology and IT professionals, um, that first level of that. Um, and then the advanced level, um, the entry level robotic systems, um, that is based on the FANUC cert cards. And so the, the FANUC certification, that first level of credential is the same. Again, FANUC was a part of this. And so if a school has a FANUC cert card, um, and a student gets there, even if they don't get their FANUC credential, they actually could take and do use that cert cart to do the robotic systems portion of this um, and get their SACA credential. Or if they passed it, then they could also obviously do the same thing and get a second credential for going through and doing that work as well. The last one is the, I, the IIoT, the Industrial Internet of Things and Data Analytics and Networks. Um, uh, part of that, and again, this is really where we're bri bridging that gap between operator and IT professionals uh, in doing that and understanding um, uh, cloud-based data acquisition systems and tying all those types of things into it. <clears throat> then the first one and the most popular one right now is the Automation System Specialist 1. And again, this is a person who would install, troubleshoot, and maintain factory automation 4.0 systems. Um, uh, automation system specialist one is 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 all done. Automation system specialist two is getting ready to be approved. Again, the way the state of Ohio set um, did it for this year, the micro credentials and there are fourteen of them. Oops, there are fourteen of them inside of um, automation system specialist one. Those are all weighted at four points apiece, and each of the associate level credentials are weighted at three points apiece. Um, is the way that the state of Ohio uh, weighted those. Then you can see we are what we are will have production systems, IT operations, um, and then also based on um, uh, demand from industry, um, one of the largest process control companies and instrumentation uh, companies is partnering with SACA to develop a process control and instrumentation specialist level um, as well. So. And then that higher level engineering level um, uh, credential, um, and that's the one that's being developed and piloted with the University of Wisconsin Stout. Again, with the, the SACA, the gold and the silver, um, gold is based on performance as well as theory, where SACA is based on theory only um, for that credential. 
And and I think is your question that you mentioned earlier. Yes, the amateur e-learning library. Um, we do have SACA prep courses built into that um, as a part of that. And so there is both silver level and gold level uh, for being able to, to do that inside of the amateur library uh, as well. I think that answered your question. The big difference with, and this is just like, like a comparison between NIMS. Uh, if you look at the duty area five of electrical systems, those um, uh, that particular one is about 165 hours. SACA, because they're working with industry when they put this together, they really wanted these micro credentials to be broken into 40 hour segments. The idea that somebody shows up for a training program on Monday and at the end of the week on Friday, they've completed a, a series of tasks and knowledge based activities and they can take a test and get a credential at the end of the week. So um, you can see here where they've broken it into these four areas of electrical systems, motor controls, motor control troubleshooting, and electrical systems installation um, with that. Those four together are 160 hours, but again, each one is broken into those different uh, uh, micro credentials uh, in being able to do that. And in the case of C201, 202, 204, 206, each one of those is a separate a specialist level micro credential um, uh, with that, and there are silver and gold for both. The associate yeah. level, sir, did you say something? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jason, I had another question that come up that kind of ties in with that is, is, is the SACA certification awarded only if the institution subscribes? To, yes. To, okay. To SACA? Yes. Yeah, in order to get access to the assessments, they do have to be a, a, a member of the Alliance in order to do that. But there is no cost for them take, for the students to take the um, assessments nor or to retake the assessments. There's never any cost. So um, for them doing that, if they're a member and that is an annual fee. Okay, thank you. We have about nine minutes left too. Okay. Yeah, real quick, the associate level, basic and advanced operations. Just want to give you an idea of the types of topics um, that, are, that are covered uh, within, the, within those. And I'm not going to read these off to you uh, in being able to do that. And I believe I shared with you, Chris, Chris this uh, presentation. And so if you can or would want to make it available to anybody that has been here today, certainly that would be great. Or they yes. can reach out to me directly and I'll be happy to share it as well. We'll forward it out. Yeah, thank you. So then the, the, the other two level of associate, you can see the robotic systems and the IIoT. Um, you know, now in the IIoT, we're talking about bar, barcodes, smart sensors, RFIDs, managed ethernet switch configurations, you know, SQL databases, all those types of things. And these are things that high school students can get. That's what's really cool about it or career tech students and, you know, and all that. So again, the more that we're able to do earlier, it's going to open up these adult ed programs as well as these uh, post-secondary programs to take their programs that much further. Because unfortunately these schools many times, you know, students shows up first day of college and the first thing I do is teach them how to, you know, use a, a micrometer you know, or understand the difference between inches and millimeters and, you know, things like that. And so, um, you know, trying to start that sooner and to do that is a very uh, big part of that. So automation system specialist, you can see is broken into these. These are the 14 micro credentials on the core um, side. There are some elective credentials that are available um, uh, as well. Um, many of those elective credentials are a part of the next level, the production level, if somebody would want to go down the production system specialist um, area. Automation system specialist uh, two, um, again, you can see is very heavy into the troubleshooting, um, uh, smart factory systems and, you know, the predictive maintenances and autonomous robots and, and machine vision, all of those types of things. So. I think I covered all this. I don't need to go through that. I know we're short. We're pretty much, I wanna allow for any other questions uh, uh, with that. Again, you'll see these these screens are very consistent with all the different ones that we work with uh, with that. But any questions? Any other questions I should say? Yeah, feel free to jump in now with the questions. Uh, 
You don't have to type them in, I'll go quicker this way. And Jason will be sending me his updated presentation and then we'll forward out to all of you today too. This was a really good uh, uh, PowerPoint, very thorough, Jason. I appreciate that. Um, Welcome, thank you, thank Jason. you for the opportunity. Hi, Jason, Linda has gone uh, speaking, North Central State College, how are you? I'm wonderful, how are you, Linda? I'm good. Hey, just a quick question. We were looking at the CLT and uh, CLTA, A. yeah. And um, it seems to be centralized around individual organization and the warehousing and not as much as um, transportation and supply chain logistics and things like that. Um, right. Is there, do one of the advanced then certificates sort of go into that area? Or is it primarily mostly within the individual warehousing? It's typically within the facilities themselves. They aren't really focused in on the, um, the, the, the transportation systems, I guess you could say. You know, mm -hmm. the, you know the, the systems that are being used for delivering of those, of those types of uh, things within that organization. So, um, yes, it is more facility-based, you know, within that, within that organization's facility. That may answer your question. Yeah, that like I say, we were looking for something that was sort of more comprehensive of actual supply chain and logistics, which you know maybe data analytics and global transportation and stuff like that. Well, that's yeah that that is that is going to be that is those systems. That's where you're going to get into that with our with the soccer credentials as well as the, um, but very specifically within that supply chain. Uh, automation um, uh, program, the CTSCA. Um, that is all about the data and the sensors and collecting of that data. And then what we do with that data once we collect it. So again, I have this package that went through the scanner. Um, and then how do I take that data and send it to my cell phone to tell me that my FedEx package, you know, is going to be delivered today at one o'clock as an example um, in doing that. It is to that level um, and being able to track and understanding how those systems work and function. That would be definitely a part of um, and that would be on that networking side of that where they would be getting into uh, understanding how those smart sensors are collecting data and how to collect data with a smart sensor. But then what do I do with that data and how do I create the systems to send that data to who needs to see it? You know, Amazon would have a very, would have a very bad day if all of a sudden they ran out of cardboard boxes, you know, <laughs> and yes, there isn't yes. somebody standing there counting cardboard boxes every day to make sure that they have enough. Those systems are completely automa automated and the person who makes those boxes, if Amazon's not making those, um, is getting sent a notification that, hey, there needs to be a delivery here because we're going to be out of boxes by Tuesday of next week. So, um, you know, that kind of stuff. So, so and again, that's, that's not going to a person. That's going to somebody else's system to tell them, which triggers an order and goes in. It isn't, you know, it isn't people who is managing this data and this information. They're just monitoring and 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 analyzing the data and the information. And you say that's under the CLA. That would be a part of the CTSCA, C the Supply Chain Automation. CTSC. Thank you, Jason. Uh-huh. So there you have it. What do you think? I'd love to talk to you about how we can make this work in your school. Reach out to me anytime via email or give me a call and let's chat.